Kirsten Hill, Cole and Cora Sayers, and Zach. Uh, there are about 80 students registered for high school week up in Fairfield. Uh, we do want to uh, have uh, have some prayer with them here in just a few moments before they take off. Uh, they're going to leave somewhere around 11 o'clock this morning. Um, today uh, is the uh, picnic and Ogden Raptors baseball game. If you have any questions about that, you should see my wife Stacy this morning. I do know that there are a few extra tickets. If you didn't get one bought or a couple bought, uh, we do have some extras. Um, the gate... Uh, for uh, entry for the picnic uh, is back there where um, where Lincoln Avenue and 23rd Street come together uh, and just around the corner from the ticket will call uh, box or the group tickets back there on the corner um, you don't go in the uh, in the front gate um, again meal starts at 1230 it's all you can eat uh, cookout food picnic food and then uh, I believe the first pitch is at two o'clock uh, we also have an announcement about an upcoming um, special event. Uh, Janice Gowdy Lock is having a significant birthday in a few weeks, and her family is celebrating um, those 80 years uh, here at the church on July the uh, July the 9th uh, from 12 to 2 uh, over here in the Fellowship Hall just after church that morning. Um, so hopefully you can come and um, celebrate um, Janice and uh, get to know her family. It'll be a great day. Uh, there'll be more information about that in the newsletter and the bulletins to come. <clears throat> uh, if you have not yet connected with us, uh, we'd love for you to do that. You can do it through Facebook, which is where some of you are probably watching this morning from home. Uh, you can also connect with us at our YouTube channel uh, or through our website, RoyChristian.org. Uh, if you'd like to get um, updates on your phone through text messages or email, you can sign up by um, texting one of those keywords to the number on the screen, 385-217-8399, uh, and you'll start getting information from us every once in a while. If you are new to the church and you haven't yet filled out one of those connection cards, Please do that. Um, there, there are cards everywhere in the chair pockets. Uh, we'd love to get your information, uh, mailing address, telephone numbers, email address, whatever you'd like to share, uh, we'd love to have. Just drop that in the offering boxes on your way out this morning. We do want to go through uh, some of the prayer requests that have come in over the last week. Um, let me remind you that you can always share requests and praises uh, by emailing prayer at roychristian.org or you can click the links um, on the website or in our newsletter that comes each week. Uh, let me go over just a few of those updates. Elena Wheeler is out of her neck brace after, um, after three months. Uh, so that is a wonderful praise. We're thrilled that she has been set free um, uh, any any comments? It's just Yay. nice to see your neck, Elena. <laughs> right? uh, it's been a very, very long time. Uh, Isabel Ballard uh, has a niece, Lindy, who was in the ICU this past week. Carrie Sarder asked us to pray for her daughter, Ashley Green. She is still having significant health issues. Uh, and also, Carrie's grandson, Isaiah, is three. Uh, he started going to a new uh, Montessori school this last week. That's a little traumatic for everybody. Uh, we do want to pray for Keepers of the Kingdom Vacation Bible School, which is coming up uh, August the 7th through the 11th. Uh, we want to have a huge bunch of kids and a bunch of smiling, happy volunteers. So if you have not yet registered or signed up to, to volunteer, uh, please go see Julie today, if you would. Uh, and now I'm going to ask Zach and all the high school crew uh, to come down here in front of the table, at least all the ones who are here so far. The others are on their way. There's just um, a couple more. So I'm going to ask... Um, a couple of our elders, if if you would come and put your hands on these sweet young children and Zach. Ooh, or all of you, that'd be great. Just 
uh, students, step out so they can get in behind you. There you go. Renew uh, friendships with, with those from other churches, but it's also a time to reflect on their walk. We know that there have been some magical stories that have come home from church camp, and we pray that there will be more as these uh, young adults uh, head up to spend a week in, in uh, your beautiful country. We pray that you'd give them safe travel, and that they would have a wonderful, uh, rewarding uh, time of fellowship and, and spiritual awareness, and that you'd bring safely with all kinds of stories to remember and to cherish. Father, we're so thankful for having these young people and, and all young people here with us to provide a future for your church. We'd ask that you provide the, the guidance, the wisdom it goes into their, their learning, their activities, their fun uh, this coming week and, and all the times in their lives. Father, we'd, we'd ask that you be with them as, and grant them safe travel to and from camp uh, and that you be with them through, throughout their lives. In his name we pray. That's probably better. Scott Wheeler just said, hey, uh, uh, don't come back with a spouse. Like, huh? Oh, yeah, because when we sent Kyle to church camp, uh, he came back with being a boyfriend-girlfriend with the person he is now married to. <laughs> don't. Wherever you are, don't. If you're blonde, don't. It's the rules. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> We are glad to have you here with us. Um, in case this is your first time here, you're not aware, uh, we don't collect an offering with baskets or plates, uh, but if you have um, a gift you'd like to share, uh, you can drop that in an offering envelope and then those boxes on the doors on your way out. If you can also give electronically, you can give through Realm, you can give through the newsletter, you can give through your however you want. Uh, we are happy uh, and blessed by you and your love for Jesus and his church. Um, thank you for uh, generously supporting the work that goes on here. i also remind you that if you need a Bible, um, that there are several of them in chair racks near you. You're welcome to take that if you need one, or if you know somebody else who needs one. Um, you're, you're free to, uh, to take those along uh, with you as well. <clears throat> um, and because I know that some of you are curious um, this is not covering up my new tattoo. Um, maybe at some point, uh, but there is a long, ugly scar here after a visit to the dermatologist. Um, had a little melanoma taken out this last week, so it's pretty, pretty itchy and ugly looking. I was going to go without it, and Stacy said, you should probably cover that up, so... <clears throat> I'd hate for you to be distracted. My glorious beauty is distraction enough, I know. So uh, I'll spare you the hideous scar tissue. Uh, we have been uh, in this current sermon series now for the last uh, eight weeks. Uh, we have talked about what our open hands do and should be doing. 
Um, we have learned that we can say a lot with our open hands. We can invite. We can give. We can re- uh, and receive. Um, we can um, we can protect and correct and forgive and embrace uh, with our open hands. Um, our last uh, message in this series is uh, today uh, about open hands that should praise. Open hands that praise. Now, uh, some of you uh, have taken advantage of a couple of our movie nights. Uh, at some point in the last few months, uh, we showed some Tim Hawkins comedy um, DVDs. Tim Hawkins is a comedian who is a Christian, and um, he has a bit about raising hands in church. I would just show it to you, but um, the YouTube copyright police don't like it when I do that kind of thing. So I'm just going to talk to you about it, and then I'll share it later on uh, on Facebook and YouTube. You can, you can watch it. It's much better when he does it than uh, when I use his material. Um, he talks about the fact that um, not everybody in the world goes to a church where they where they raise hands in some way or at some point. So he offers this little tutorial about how you can, you know, ease your way in to, uh, to raising your hands in church. He says you start out with your hands in your pocket and your elbows. You just kind of do this, this elbow flap thing while the music is going along because you're really not quite sure you're really all the way there. And then maybe your hands slip out of your pockets and you're, you're doing this. He calls this carry the TV. <laughs> and then, you know, once you get into it, you carry a much bigger television. Um, uh, after carrying the TV, sometimes people move their hands up and like this, my fish was this big. And then for some of you liars, uh, your fish was, was this big. He also talks about uh, when you put your hands out and hold my baby, uh, we, we want God to, to do that. And occasionally, you've, you may have seen dueling light bulbs, <laughs> screwing them in. Uh, he talks about goalpost. You know, that's, that's popular, and sometimes people will have some heartburn, too. Uh, maybe they go from goalpost to double heartburn back out to their goalpost. Uh, favorite one is the Mufasa. <laughs> and then he has a combo, um, which is the pointer hatchet schoolroom. Uh, many women's, including my own sweet, wonderful wife. She's really big into wash the window <laughs> back and forth. Uh, and then he closes with village people, Rocky touchdown. Okay. Now. This message is not a sermon about you all being freed up in church to start doing whatever it is you think you want to do in worship. You are totally free here to raise your hands, to kneel down, to lay down on the floor if you'd want to during worship, or kneel. Uh, we, we have never told anybody they shouldn't do those kinds of things. Um, my wife, way freed up. Her husband, Pretty not freed up. Uh, There are very strong opinions about what your hands do in worship. Um, There are people who are very, very firmly uh, believing that you must raise your hands in worship because if you don't, you're not really a Christian and you're not really worshiping. There are people who are on the other end of that spectrum that say, if you raise your hands in worship, you are caught up in something else. It's not worship, and you may not even be a Christian, okay? (laughs) Here's what I find in the Bible, okay? I don't really care about what most people think. I want to know what I see in Scripture, all right? In the Old Testament, there are a few passages that um, link lifted hands and praise to the Lord. And as you might imagine, many of those come from the book of Psalms, 150 songs, prayer songs uh, that were written by David and a number of other people uh, as they they sought to praise the Lord. Uh, One of those written by David, Psalm 63, says, I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name 
I will lift up my hands. In Psalm 28, verses 1 and 2, David sings, To you, Lord, I call. You are my rock. Do not turn a deaf ear to me, for if you remain silent, I will be like those who go down to the pit. Hear my cry for mercy as I call to you for help, as I lift my hands toward your most holy place. In Psalm 141, verses 1 and 2, David sings, I call to you, Lord, come quickly to me. Hear me when I call to you. May my prayer be set before you like incense. May the lifting up of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. David, spiritual hero, lifted his hands in prayer and praise to God often. There's a psalm used by Israel as they went up to worship, uh, which directs the people. Uh, this is Psalm 134, verse 2, which we read um, before our service got started. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. In Nehemiah, chapter 8, verse 6. You should read through the book of Nehemiah at some point. It's a great story of how things were being rebuilt after uh, captivity and exile for a very long time. Uh, Ezra, who is the teacher of the law, has assembled the people, and as he praises the Lord in the presence of the people, the folks in Jerusalem responded by lifting their hands and shouting, Amen, Amen. And then they bowed down with their faces to the ground in worship. What's the point? There are a lot of hands lifted in praise and worship and prayer to God in the Old Testament. Now, there is a related move um, in the Old Testament, uh, which I hadn't realized until not very many months ago. It's a part of our, uh, our study on Thursday nights, where it says that people spread out their hands. I, maybe you have noticed that and just think, well, that's kind of a weird thing to do. That it's, a, it's not just a euphemism. It's a, uh, an indication that people are spreading out their hands in prayer to God. There are many, many people in the Old Testament who spread out their hands to the Lord. People like Moses in Exodus 9. Solomon, the king in 1 Kings 8. Ezra in uh, Ezra 9, the sons of Korah, who wrote many psalms, like Psalm 88, David, Psalm 143, Jeremiah, the prophet, in chapter 4, verse 31, and also the prophet Isaiah. They're all spreading out their lifted hands to the Lord God of Israel in prayer and worship. Spreading out hands is equivalent to praying to God. One of the passages used by some people as a New Testament command to raise hands in worship is in a letter from Paul to Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8 says, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. And that sounds kind of like a direct order, right? Paul says, I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. So here's the question. Is that a command that you must pray if you're a man with your hands lifted up? Or is the concern something else? Is Paul more concerned about the holiness of those hands that are being lifted? See, I think that's it. Paul is much more concerned about the quality of the hands, the righteousness, the holiness, the goodness, the purity of the hands that are being lifted up in prayer because God's people are supposed to be holy. They're set apart, consecrated to God and to his service. The Bible does tell us that even when people are raising energetic, enthusiastic hands in worship and prayer... God will ignore them when they are attached to guilty, unclean, rebellious, weak hearts. We learned that in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 15. 
You can be all about the hand races, every position from your pockets to the goalpost and everywhere in between. You can be swaying in the breeze back and forth. But if your heart is rebellious and unclean and selfish and weak, God does not accept that praise. So, why raise hands in worship? Why raise hands in worship? Well, I think maybe because the, one of the primary relationships that we have with God is child-father, child-parent. When you got a two- or three-year-old run around the house, how do they spend most of their childhood? What do they want? Well, they want a lot of stuff <laughs> they, because they need a lot of things. Sometimes they come and they want like a cookie or, or juice. They, they want something. And so they want you to give something to them. They know that there is no way they're getting it unless you're involved. They're too short. Sometimes they come to you and what do they want? They have tears streaming down their face, wailing, sobbing. What do they want? Up, up, pick me up. I, know I want to be held. I need comfort. I need you to fix things. I think, however, as a child reaches up and out to a parent, that's very much what we find ourselves doing in reaching out to God. We want to be held. I don't know how I'm going to get through this, but I know that if I'm wrapped up in my father's big, strong arms, everything's going to be okay. I'm sad. I, I need comfort. I need reassurance. I need something from you, God. And so I'm, I'm asking you to give it to me. P please, I want to receive from you. Ultimately, when we raise up our hands, when we reach out to God, we're recognizing that he is the source of everything that we really need. In David's life, when things seemed the worst, the little shepherd king praised God, whether he was in the pasture or on the battlefield or in the middle of the wilderness fleeing from death. David sang. In 2 Samuel 22, we see one of those songs. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge, and my Savior. That's as he is being chased by Saul, being pursued to be killed, and after God has delivered him over and over again from his enemies. Like James, James, James. See, that's the thing. You're all Old Testament with this stuff. That's all Old Testament things. Those don't matter because we are New Testament Christians. We are not bound by all that stuff we see in the Old Testament. We're not making sacrifices. We're not killing animals on the altar. That doesn't matter. It does, that's, that's past. Really? Because I think it still works in the New Testament. Uh, for example... Paul and Silas, in the 16th chapter of Acts, have been arrested. They are in the inner cell, the lowest cell, the creepiest, darkest, grossest cell in the jail in Philippi. They have been arrested. They have been stripped. They have been beaten with rods. They have been flogged. And they are chained to the stocks. And there is music coming out of their cell. But it's not a sad harmonica and the wailing blues. It is hymns of praise, songs of rejoicing. Later on, when Paul is writing a letter to the believers in the city of Philippi, who would have known about his experience there because he started the church the day after he got out of the jail in Philippi, he told those Philippians that regardless of the situation, they should not be anxious about anything, but they should pray about everything. And when they did that, then 
then they would have peace from God. That's Philippians 4, 6, and 7. He wrote to them in that same chapter that he had learned to be content in every circumstance. Verse 11. And he reminded them, verse 4, to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say it, rejoice. Open hands, reaching out to God in praise and worship. Praise God anyway. Praise God anyway. There is a good reason to do so. Psalm 22 in the King James Version, uh, verse 3 says that the Lord inhabits the praise of Israel. I've, I've had that phrase tucked away in my head for a really long time, that God inhabits praise. Like, that's kind of a weird phrase. I don't know exactly what that means. The New International Version says that God is enthroned by the praise of Israel. Inhabits, enthroned. They're connected. They don't seem very much the same, but the main idea is that God sits down with us as we praise. He pulls up a chair, he sits down, he gets comfortable as we sing to him, as we cry out to him, as we pray to him. He dwells in the praises that his people bring him in worship. You cannot be much closer to God than when you praise him. You thought about that? Think about some of the moments when you have felt the closest to God. Maybe like our high school students who just took off for church camp. Maybe it was around the campfire middle of the woods someplace at a week of church camp or at a big conference. Maybe it was in a special church service that you attended someplace. Maybe it was just you alone singing to God on the side of the mountain along a trail somewhere. And in that moment, you felt extremely close to him. It's because it's true. God inhabits. He sits down smack dab in the middle of our praises to be with us. So, many of you would never get up on stage to sing a song or to play a song. But whenever you worship, you are performing a concert for an audience of one. Front row center. That's where God is sitting as you bring him this gift of praise and worship. But I suppose that it works in both directions. Not only are we close to God when we praise Him, but I believe it's also true that when we come into the presence of God, our immediate response is to bow down in worship. When we are presented with the ultimate goodness and holiness and majesty of God, we are also immediately confronted by our own flaws and failures, our own selfishness and sinfulness. God, you are so great. You are so good. You are so holy, so pure, so right. Wow, I am really not. I am instantly aware of how very far I am from you when I am in your presence, Lord. And so many times when people are confronted by the presence of God, they fall down and they cry out. We see it especially in the book of Revelation, the throngs of heaven, various level, uh, levels and layers of the inhabitants of, of heaven cry out to God in his presence. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. 
when we come into the presence of God, our response should be humble praise and worship. We know that when we worship him, when we raise out our hands in prayer and worship, that we are never closer to him than in that moment. That's why it makes sense for us in every situation to praise God anyway because it is the way that we can draw near to him. In those moments where everything is great and good, it's easy to praise. In other moments, maybe not so obvious that that's what we should do. We can know the peace and the power of his presence when we raise open hands to praise him. Not very long ago, um, in another one of our movie nights, we showed The Hiding Place, which is the story of Corey and Betsy Ten Boom and what they endured during World War II after they were arrested for sheltering Jews from the Nazis. They were sent to Ravensbrück camp where they suffered physically for 10 months. Awful, horrible conditions. Platforms for 80 women in one barracks building to sleep on. Rotten, disgusting straw surrounded by fleas everywhere. An awful, awful experience with the smoke of the ovens all the time, belching the reminder that at any moment, their life could be ended. Corey wrote later that it is fine to praise God for his goodness when he sends sunshine and good weather for a picnic like today. But God was still good and worthy of praise as Corey watched her sister Betsy slowly starve to death at Ravensbrook. He is always good. He is always loving. He is always worthy of our thanks and praise. Always. Rejoice in the Lord always, and I will say it again. Rejoice. Let's pray. Father, uh, you know how quickly and easily we can praise you when life is good and how very difficult it is for us to praise you otherwise. We confess that our worship depends way too much on how we feel about our circumstances and situations and not nearly enough on your unchanging character. So God, forgive us. Forgive us when we fail to praise you because we're unhappy, because we're upset, because we're angry, because we're hurt. By your grace, Father, will you please help us to praise you at all times, to praise you anyway, Amen. We bring him the sacrifice of our lives. That's the greatest gift we can bring to him, the greatest praise we can bring. If you would like to have a conversation about what you need to do uh, in your next step of life, um, I would love to chat with you. Our elders would like to talk with you. Um, we want to help you take that next step of faith with Jesus. Uh, we are going to close with communion this morning, as always. Uh, so I'll ask if four men would come and to begin to serve the elements to the congregation. If you're watching from home, uh, if you'd please get those uh, that bread and grape juice ready as well to partake with us in just a few moments. Tim Rohde is going to come and share a few thoughts with us about communion today.
The first tells us what our attitude should be, and the second tells us how grateful we should be. Both are important as we approach the Lord's table and prepare to partake in this celebration. Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11 says, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus was humble, willing to give up his rights in order to obey God and serve people. Like Jesus, we should have a servant's attitude serving out of our love for God and others, not out of guilt or shame. Jesus did not have to go to the cross. Just like you and me, he had free will. However, Jesus was obedient to God's will, and he wants us to be obedient as well. He knew what he would experience, and yet he still was obedient. Romans 5.8 is probably my number one favorite. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, think of that for a moment. Those were amazing words. God sent Jesus to die for us. Not because we were good enough, but because he loved us. The next time you feel uncertain about God's love for you... Remember that he loved you even before you turned to him. If God loved you even when you were a rebel, he can surely strengthen you now that you love him in return. As we approach the Lord's table this morning, I ask you to recommit yourself to humble service, to obedience, and to be grateful for the love that God has for us through the death of his son on our behalf even before we deserved it. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and gave thanks and broke it. And he said, this is my body for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Do this. Praise God. We're glad you came to worship with us today. Uh, We hope and pray that you are building a strong connection with Christ Jesus. Uh, Let me close with some words from uh, Paul, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Let us rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Amen. We look forward to seeing you again soon, whether it's right here in this room or uh, online. If you are watching online, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, say hello. Let us know what's going on in your world. Uh, we're, we look forward to hearing from you all again uh, sometime very soon. That'll bring our stream to a close this morning. Uh, and now our band is going to come and lead us in a few more minutes.